All right. Uh, everyone have their parts downloaded now? Good? No? Get out of here. All right, cool. So we're gonna get started on today's workshop. So today we'll be going over rendering and simulations, okay? Um, so these are all the little cool extra, like pretty functions in SolidWorks that we'll be playing around with that's not essential to making a design, um, but for presenting and also doing analysis on it, right? Uh, that's kind of the portion of this uh, phase for the program, um, design and analysis, so yeah. So we're gonna start by opening up your um, the assembly file that came with the robot. Uh, let's see, where did mine go? Cool. While that's loading, um, just keep in mind your projects are due the 26th. Um, next week during this time, we'll be having office hours. Um, so officers will be in here for you guys to have um, just time to like work on your projects, um, kind of consult with your peers as well as officers, get any help you need, um, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then the week after that another office hour, and then over the holiday your projects will be due. So if you haven't gotten started on it yet, get started on it. Cool. Alright. So everyone have this file um, opened up already? Cool. Okay, so just briefly before we start all the appearances stuff, um, I want to mention the pack and go function. So this will come in nifty um, when you guys have to pack and go your files um, once you're done with your project to turn it in. So you can access that function in file on the top left right there. And if you go down, there's a button that says pack and go. All right, we're gonna move on. So, on the pack and go function, um, just give that a click for now. When you do, this fold, uh, this dialog box opens up, right? Um, so pretty much this is what, what you'll be seeing when you guys do the pack and go for your guys' uh, project. Um, cool thing about this is that SolidWorks will automatically consolidate the files for you, even, though, even, the, even if the parts are all in different folders. Um, so any part file, um, and as you can see, drawings, simulation results, toolbox parts, and custom decal and appearances, um, if they're all in different folders, but they're referenced into this part, SolidWorks will consolidate them into a single file for you, a uh, single folder at least. So when you do that, um, you can check these off. Uh, uh, um, you'll be checking include drawings off um, because you'll be including drawings for certain parts and your assembly as well. Um, you could do include simulation results if you could decide to submit a simulation result as well, which we'll be talking more about later on. Um, and then you can save it to a folder or you could save it to a zip file. So SolidWorks will automatically compress it into a zip file for you. And then um, this is what we want though when you submit it. So it's a compressed file that you'll be submitting. Um, after you do that, select all the options you want, making sure all the parts you want in the pack and go are listed here. You can do save, saves it as a file, and then email it towards us. Yeah, or we're gonna exit this because we don't need that. Hmm. All right, so we're gonna be messing around with appearances today first. Um, so first thing you could do is, um, I briefly talked about applying materials to, uh, material properties to your part or assembly um, last week or a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go in a little bit more in depth about that then we'll be expanding on it as we do our simulations portions later on. Um, so yeah, if you go to your feature tree on the left, right, when you click on the little drop down box under a part, for example, I'm gonna look at this robot body right now. Um, you see that there's a little line that says material, right? Currently it says not specified. So a very uh, generic material property is loaded onto our robot body. Um, but 
in real life, everything has a material property of sort, right? Um, it's either metal, plastic, some kind of um, um, some kind of like hybrid co co a composition of something. Um, so yeah, we're gonna check that out. So you can select any part you want for the time being. I'm gonna go to the body, hover over the material, right click it, and then click edit material on top. So when you do this, um, this immense like list of materials open up, right? The first thing by default, the steel tab is um, checked on, so you can see all the different alloys of steel. If I reduce that, you can see there's a folder for iron, aluminum, copper, titanium, zinc, other plastics, other metals. I mean, I guess uh, other non-metals, generic glass fibers, carbon fibers, silicons, rubber, and woods. So yeah, there's uh, pretty much just about any uh, material that you could think of um, that's a generic like engineering material. And even if it comes down to you using a very like spe uh, special type of material that's not on this list, you can always reference online for certain material properties and then add your own custom parameters in order to define your material. So for now, we're going to go into the aluminum tab and then scroll down until you see 6061T6. So. As soon as you click it, you see that this window right here becomes populated with a bunch of information. So 6061 is a very common alloy of aluminum that um, a lot of industries use for um, engineering applications, like bike frames are made out of them. Certain portions of airplanes are made out of them, although most of it's usually made out of 7075. Um, it's one of the most readily available types of aluminum out there. Um, that T6 notation that comes after the 6061 refers to a kind of a tempering that's done to the metal. Um, so the difference between 6061T4 right above it and 6061T6 is that those two have the same material composition, um, but they're heat treated in a different way in order to give them different like strength characteristics. Um, so that's something you guys will learn more as you guys take um, like Matsai 104 and whatnot. Um, and then you see under the properties tab right here, there's all of these information here, right? So elastic modulus, um, which is a ratio of stress versus strain, which is kind of like, okay, if I apply this much force to a part, how much will it deflect by, right? Um, Poisson's ratio, which defines um, when you pull on an object, it lengthens in one direction, but starts shrinking in another direction to compensate for that, right? Um, what's the ratio of the bed? Tensile strength, um, at what amount of pressure when I pull on this part, will it break? Um, yield strength, um, very similar, but more so when you're actually like sharing the material rather than just pulling on it. Um, and they even have like thermal expansion coefficients. Um, this is important because later on in simulations, um, you're allowed to do like thermal analysis, um, like heat cycles and whatnot. Um, mass density, hardening factor, um, all that kind of information is there. Some of the alloys, um, some of the very rare metals um, are missing some of this information. Um, if you ever need that information in here to run a certain simulation, you can always find it online and fill it in, um, and they'll let you run the simulation. So yeah, um, when you apply a material property to a part or an assembly, um, it's pretty important that you do that as you start designing things, because it comes down to three things. Um, one, it kind of changes the color of your part um, by default to whatever SolidWorks it finds that part color should be based on that material. So it helps you identify certain parts based on their materials in a big assembly. Um, two, it gives it its mechanical properties, like all this stuff. And because it has its mechanical properties, um, you're allowed to evaluate its weight um, and not just kind of blindly guess, oh, this might be 100 to 3,000 pounds. Who knows, right? Um, it really depends on what material you're using and the density of it. Um, so yeah, if you're trying to build something that's very material de uh, weight dependent, like our BattleBots, which have to be strictly like constrained to like three pounds, 60 pounds, right? It's important that you give it these material properties as you go along when you're designing your part. Cool, okay, so once you select the material you want, just click on apply at the bottom here. And then once you do, you can close that. So it's kind of hard to tell because aluminum kind of comes out as this color as well. But currently, this body portion is a slightly lighter color than everything else right now. Um, if I were to give this head portion 
let's see. Actually, I'm just going to do this arm. Put it in material, and I'm going to give it a standard steel and apply to it. You guys can see now that the body and the arm have a distinctly different color, right? The arm has more of a bronzish kind of um, like hue to it, um, whereas the body, which is aluminum, aluminum has more of a um, silverish sheet to it. Um, so, yeah, you'll notice it in real life too. Um, steel generally has a darker tone um, than aluminum does. Aluminum pretty much looks like pure silver, um, whereas steel looks a lot more like chrome with a darker hue to it. Um, so yeah, so that's one way of changing kind of your appearance, uh, appearance on your assembly file, um, just by giving it a material property, right? Um, so yeah, so you define the material for everything the way you want it, but let's say that ideally you don't want it to look this way, right? Oftentimes products are painted over or colored um, to a specific color, right? Um, and you want to kind of deck it out, make it look cool. Um, so we're going to kind of figure out how to apply colors um, to all these parts. So, first thing we're going to do is from here, on the top, underneath the toolbar, right here, there's a button that says Edit Appearance. So, we're going to give that a click. And then on the left, the Property Manager uh, tab changes, and also this the side, the right side right here. Um, it also changes as well. So we're going to go through the property managers and I'm going to talk about each of the parts and what they kind of mean. push on through um, sake of time cool so if you look at on the left in your properties manager tab um, the first portion you see is select geometry right there right um, and the two options you're given is apply a component level and apply a part document level so when you're doing apply a component level in an assembly um, when you apply a certain appearance property to it it changes the appearance of the entire component so if I were to select the torso and change the color of that, the entire torso portion would turn into that color. If I was to click apply a part document level and apply a color to uh, a certain portion, um, I have the ability to customize certain faces, edges, curvatures, so a lot smaller subsection of a certain part. Um, so we'll be kind of going through that. Um, so for now, um, just keep apply a component level checked on and when this box here is highlighted blue, it's asking for, okay, select the component now. Um, we're gonna select this head right here. And you see this yellow wireframe box forming around it saying that this head is selected right now. Scroll on down and then right here, in the next tab, this is color. It lets you choose whatever color you wanna define it as. So yeah, um, this is up to you guys, kind of have fun. Um, choose whatever color you want. I'm gonna go with green. It's really gross, oh, it's really gross. Oh well, we're gonna go with green still. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of options of doing it. Um, they give you a predefined certain uh, a palette right here. Um, they let you kind of use a crosshair to slide around at different hues, and also you can numerically define the proportions of each color you want. Um, so if anyone ever used like just paint or even Photoshop. Um, today there'll be a lot of terms that kind of used um, seem familiar to you. Um, but yeah, so give the head a certain color you want. And then once you're done with that, you could go ahead and click the OK button on the top left of that properties manager tab. And then while you're at it, go ahead and start giving colors to all your other parts as well, in the same fashion. So, edit appearance, with your selected body part, uh, whatever part you want. 
go down to it, give it whatever color you want, whether it's the same or different. So for the time being, we're going to still be using apply at component level in the selected geometry. Um, and then we'll be exploring the other function right after we define all our parts colors. Then So once you apply the color to all your components, uh, look up. So you know, to move on. If you're having trouble, just raise your hand. We'll go around helping you guys out. So yeah, feel free to choose whatever colors you guys want to make your robot look either really cool or really gross. Um, freedom is yours. Cool. All right. So we noticed when we did the apply component level, um, we just get this entire portion, the entire part going into a solid color, right? Um, this time we're going to go in and start selecting just um, certain faces. Um, so click on edit appearance again. And this time in the selected geometry, we're going to click apply at part document level. So click on that. And then immediately after you click it, right? to the left of the selection box, you see a few more options open up, right? Um, so the first one is applying it to the whole part. Um, whatever property you want to apply to it, it'll attempt to um, select the entire part to apply that color to. The next one is selected faces. So you're allowed to just select faces, like certain sides, in order to apply that color property, appearance property onto. And there's selected surfaces, which includes contours, um, selected bodies, which will um, select entire um, 3D models at once. And selected features, which could be just things like fillets, um, little curvatures, splines, um, lofts, um, things like that that aren't pure faces or curvatures quite. Um, yeah, so with that selected, um, we're going to click on select faces. And then from there, you can start selecting individual portions to apply colors to. All right, um, apologies on that. I guess it doesn't work anymore. Um, but yeah, when you apparently have a um, apply color appearance to an entire component level, um, it just overrides any other document level color appearances that you try to apply to it. So yeah, if you're having that issue, just go click on your part, stop it, and edit appearance. Um, select the part you want to edit. With the apply a component level selected, you could just do remove appearance. I'll get rid of it. And then with that part still selected, you could go into a document level and then start applying the colors to it. 
So, like, I could make Justice Face yellow, hopefully. There we go. And this one. So for each unique face you want to apply a color to, you have to do reopen edit appearance and then continue applying the colors to it. Ooh. So yeah, um, in the meantime, play around with that, customize your robots um, to whatever you guys want. Um, I'll be kind of expanding on your options here for a while. Um, so yeah, this time if you look on the right, side, um, there's a little line that says appearances and parentheses color, right? Click on the drop down for that. And then unlike just a standard color that we used to play around with and decide on the left, um, the right side has appearances that have predefined textures, colors, patterns, um, name it, and you get it on there. So you guys can explore. Um, so I'm going to go into plastic, high gloss. And then right below, as soon as you select it, um, a bunch of options are loaded. So from white high gloss plastic to black high gloss plastic to blah, 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 blah. You could drag these onto, should be able to. Oh, maybe not. Let's see. Ah, OK, there we go. There we go. So yeah, um, in order to edit the appearances in this method um, by using all these um, predefined textures and colors, um, you don't have to be in the edit appearance um, mode. Um, you could just have this open right here. Uh, and then you just click on a face you want to edit, and then you just double click on the texture you want. So we're going to look at some of the different options we have here. Ooh, organic. Diamond. Oh. oh, now it's clear. Oh, I guess diamonds are clear. Brick. We're going to have a brick robot. Awesome. Oh, wow. Look at that. Why, why is the front face gone? Oh, well. All right. Look at that. Our entire robot is made of bricks now. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, if you want a Rick robot, that's a, that's a possibility. So yeah, play around with it. Um, just kind of, I'll give everyone about 10 minutes to kind of just apply the um, settings you want to it. Um, and I'll be kind of talking about some other things in that meanwhile. So yeah, once you have the appearances you want, you can also apply scenery to your background. So back here at the top, there's a button right next to the edit appearance button called apply scene. Give that a click. And then you're given with some of these different options. Um, courtyard background, rooftop, soft spotlight. Some of these are just different sceneries, while other ones like these two are actual places. Um, so I'm going to click on courtyard background. And now our brick robot is in a, is floating in the middle of the air in a court yard background. <laughs> oh, it's actually really small. See, if you look at it this way, it's really big. If you look at this, it's tiny. So yeah, play around for now. Um, I'll give you guys a few more minutes to kind of just play around. Okay. 
So yeah, um, I noticed that for some people, um, trying to load appearances doesn't quite work. Apologies for that. Um, sometimes when SolidWorks installs them on these computers, I guess they don't get all the files on there. Um, yeah. In that case, um, try to load up any background you can. Um, it's not really important. It's just to kind of play around with. Um, it should work on your guys' computers when you install the um, software at home, though. By messing around with like the background settings and your robot cult like appearance, um, you can make like weird sceneries like this. Are they useful? Not always. I mean, sometimes it's good for presentations, um, but other times it's just for playing around. Um, but we'll see why it gets really cool in a bit. Why being able to apply all these sceneries and like textures and uh, color appearances are, are really dope. got three more minutes to play around and then from there we'll go into rendering. Help on anything with this so far? No? Okay. Good. Good. So apparently you could give your parts the texture of orange juice. I don't know what that really means, but my robot here is now made of orange juice. What are you doing? I don't know, you ask him. <laughs> Just 
Okay, so, yeah, um, we're gonna move on from here. We're gonna start playing around with some of the rendering tools, uh, make some final changes you'd like to your appearance. And for background, um, just go back to three point faded, the default. All right, so at the top of your toolbar, um, you will see a tab that says SolidWorks add-ins. Give that a click. So SolidWorks add-ins, um, there's a lot of cool functions on there. Um, by default, not all of them are loaded onto your software when you start it. Um, simulation is by default. You can change these settings if you want, and your preferences. Um, but as you can see, there's like CircuitWorks, which lets you work with like electrical components. PhotoView, which is what we'll be playing with. Scan to 3D, SolidWorks Motion, which is like an animation process, routing for wires, simulation for FEA, which we'll be playing around in a bit, toolbox, blah, 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 blah. Um, they also have like um, fluid dynamics analysis stuff on there too. So for the time being, click on Photo View 360. So this is the rendering um, kind of application in uh, SolidWorks that will make things really pretty for you. Um, if it's not already pretty to you at least. So as soon as you click that, you notice that the button becomes depressed, and a little tab called Render Tools opens up on your toolbar. Um, so give that a click. So, um, much sim um, uh, very similar to what we just did to everything here, um, the first option is Edit Appearance, right? Um, it lets you do exactly what we just did, going around changing the appearance of our part, the background, yada yada. Um, yeah, once you're done, you, once you've made all the changes you want, just yeah. click OK right there, or up here. It's a green check mark. Check mark. Cool. <coughs> so from there, there's all these other options here. So integrated preview, preview window, final render, render region. Um, so integrated preview will let you um, will render this model right in the screen and let you interact with it at the same time. Um, the only reason why you would use that is if you need to quickly see a quick preview of what things are going to look like. Um, just give that a click for the time being. Uh, when it says all this stuff, just ignore it. Click on turn on perspective view right in the middle. And you'll see your computer starting to do this thing for a while, loading, loading, loading. Um, and then it'll kind of freeze for a bit. So. Rendering takes a lot of resources from your computer because it's trying to um, load things. Hello? What if I say no? I don't have any other option. Oop. Cancel. So, what you guys just saw there right now is the computer is going, uh, breaking the screen up into little individual pixels and attempting to render it into a, like a final, uh, like a finer, um, like visual quality. So. As we can notice, it's extremely slow to manipulate your model, right? Because every time you slightly change the view angle or the zoom, um, the computer has to reprocess that, right? Um, but just looking at this right now, it looks a lot cooler, right? You can see some shadows on it. It looks like as if light's coming from the side and touching it. Um, the texture on it, the brick texture, looks a lot more detailed. And it, yeah, it looks a lot cooler. Um, so yeah, this is just a basic, um, this is the lowest rendering quality you, you rendering quality you could get in SOLIDWORKS um, by doing an integrated preview. So yeah, um, for the time being, click on integrated preview again to deselect it. And then we'll go into options on the top there. So when you click options, um, on the left, your properties tab opens up with all these me uh, menu uh, items. And I'll be kind of talking about it briefly. So. so the first part right here that opens up in the Properties Manager is Output Image Settings. So pretty much what this allows you to do is um, define the image size. Um, pretty much what rendering does is that you end up saving a final rendered um, like image file of your part or your assembly, right? Um, and then you come at different resolutions, different sizes. Um, so you, you could define that here, the width and the height. Um, so a typical like high definition monitor screen will be about 1080 pixels by, um, what was it, 1920 by 1080. 
So it would be a width of 1920 by 1080 height. And all the uh, other options, so using background aspect ratio, um, pretty much what that means is that it'll automatically try to load the ratio that this screen is at. Um, so if you click that, it'll default load, I think, a 9 by 16 by 9. I was around 1.25 by 1, based on the projector for me at least. Um, so that's the ratio that I'll keep when it's trying to render this image. So I'm going to have that checked off for now. So this next parameter here, it says output ambient occlusion. So that's a button that you can click um, check on or off. Uh, pretty much what ambient occlusion does is that the computer calculates how much ambient light is being reflected in this virtual little room here this little virtual studio, um, that increases the amount of time it takes to process your rendering, of course. Um, but at the same time, you get a nicer result. Um, it's not necessarily always desirable, depending on how fast you want your renders. Um, so yeah, that's a personal choice, depending on what you want. That's something you can play around with. Um, image format. So this lets you choose which file to save it as. So you have a bunch of choices. Um, you can save it as a JPEG, older versions of JPEG, PNGs, whatnot. Um, my favorite format to save it in is PNG, um, usually because it tends to be a lossless image file format, whereas JPEG tends to deteriorate every time you save um, or copy and paste the file. So yeah, that's something you can control. So we're going to change that to PNG for now. The next line, default image path, lets you choose where to save this image to after it's done rendering, right? So we're going to just put that somewhere on our desktop. So the next line, uh, the next box says render quality, right? Um, so preview render quality. So what is it going to look like when you're just wanting to preview it? Um, obviously, if you want a quicker preview, um, usually it's okay to lower it down. Um, good is about as low as you could go. Um, but for the final render quality, you obviously want to bump it up depending on how nice you want it, right? Um, but the premise is the same for everything else. Like a larger file, a larger image file, and a better render quality leads to a longer render time. So it really um, depends on what time you could afford. Um, sometimes it might take several hours to render a really high quality picture depending on your computer. So for the time being, we're going to have it at good. And when you guys are home, you guys could try this on your own, set it to maximum, have it render overnight, and see what the results are like in the morning. So the next part, gamma. So gamma, um, this is something that might be familiar for people who do like photo editing. Um, gamma, from what I understand, it is as is a um, like a luminesc luminescence correction. It kind of controls how bright and um, your rendering image would be. Um, I'm not a photographer, so this is not my forte. But the next thing is Bloom. So Bloom is kind of cool. If you have it checked on and then you start bumping up the values on Bloom, uh, it kind of has that glow effect. So any part where light is reflected off of, um, they'll kind of shine a little bit more and then like bleed out, um, giving it like a kind of like very epic kind of look to it. Um, so it really depends what you're go uh, going for um, in your visual quality. And then the next portion is contour and cartoon rendering. So obviously realistic items don't tend to have a nicely defined edge contour to it. Um, by controlling, um, by using contour or cartoon rendering, you could put those lines in on your render and you could change the thickness of it as well. Typically I like it, I like leaving it off. And everything else below that is unnecessary. Um, something cool about this version of SolidWorks is though it allows it has a network rendering where if you have your computer registered as a part of like kind of a company, um, it lets you access like a central server to process your renderings, which would do it a lot faster than your personal computer would, um, and then takes the load off your computer. So yeah, so once you make made some of these changes, just click on the OK box, green check mark on top. And then zoom out to where you want to see your robot. And then we're going to click on the preview window button on the top there. <coughs> so 
So this pop windows window opens up, and it'll attempt to give you a preview image of what your render would look like. So yeah, so with all the parameters that we entered, with our lighting um, and whatnot, this is what the um, render quality would look like. Um, from here, um, you can either save the preview image directly, um, but we're gonna back out for now. And then we're gonna click on the final render button. So if you only wanted a specific portion of this robot rendered, um, there's a button that says render region, which would let you select what portion just uh, to render. Um, this is good if you only want to um, spend time rendering a smaller portion of your part rather than the whole thing. Uh, we're just gonna go to final render, give that a click. And then you'll see this window open up. So currently the computer is going through the same image multiple times and then rendering it in multiple layers, as you can see, right? You can see the faint outline of the robot right now. And then these little boxes are coming in to do a final render of those positions. So the speed of this is obviously dependent on the hardware you have. Um, so if you have a really monster of a desktop, this will happen in no time. If you have a little laptop or like a netbook and you're trying to render on that, good luck, have fun. <laughs> That's all I could really say to that. <laughs> or come in this room and then have this, um, these computers do it for you. So yeah, so from here, this is the final render quality you would get. So from here, you could click on Save Image. And then it'll take you to, OK, where do you want to save it now? I'm just going to do somewhere on the desktop. Save it there. Then when we go into our desktop now, we should be able to find a rendered image. So yeah, so rendering will come super useful for you guys when you guys are doing presentations for a product, right? Um, whether it's something for a club, it's a personal project you're working on and you're trying to do a pitch, um, maybe you're trying to do a startup and you're trying to sell a product, right? Um, this is the beauty of using the render tool. You can make things that look very simple, and very just like geometrically like normal on a computer screen, look a lot more realistic and, and say, okay, yeah, this is what I will make, although I didn't quite make it yet. Spend money on me, please. Um, I mean, that's how some people do it, so. Yeah, um, any questions about rendering so far? Just in general at all? No? Anyone having any trouble getting to this part? If not, we're gonna start moving towards the simulation aspect of the software. Okay, cool. So, with that, we're gonna close this window. We're gonna close this file. Don't say it, you guys can save or don't save, it doesn't really matter. And then from here, we're going to open up that last file that was in the folder by itself open. It's called Lamau, I think. Hey, man. I have to come to the name. <laughs> so, where is it? Lamau Solid Part. There it is. <laughs> so this is our part. So it serves no, no purpose at all. It's just, it just looks that way. But it's just, uh, we'll be doing a simple like beam deflection test on it um, in the analysis software. Um, and you guys will see kind of how it reacts to certain loads and whatnot, and also learn about all the different functions of the simulation um, software. Cool. So yeah, this is what's given to us. Uh, previously, I mentioned that um, you need to apply material. You should apply materials to everything that you're working on, right? You might as well. Um, if you're going to run a simulation, it's very important that you have to apply material properties to it. It'll kind of force you to do it regardless. Um, so we'll be going step by step through that. For the time being, I'm not gonna apply material properties to it. So everyone have this open up? Cool, all right. So on the top tool ribbon, um, there's a tab that says simulation. If you don't have that tab open, 
go to the SOLIDWORKS add-ins tab and click on SOLIDWORKS simulation. And then the simulation tab should load up for you right after that. There you go. So once you have the simulation tab opened up, by default, you see that all the options are kind of grayed out at the current moment. They don't really give you a choice. Um, so you have to start with that first button, study advisor, or new study. So um, the simulation process in SOLIDWORKS is super helpful um, because when you click on the study advisor, um, pretty much the software guides you through the process. Um, if you were to click on this little drop down arrow underneath the study advisor, you would see that there's an option of study advisor and new study. Um, if you do new study, um, it's kind of like um, the software assumes, okay, you know what you're doing, we're just gonna let you apply the settings on your own. Um, but for the time being, we're gonna click on study advisor. Boop. And this right toolbar op open, uh, opens up and says, welcome, SOLIDWORKS simulation advisor. Um, pretty much it's trying to take you step by step by uh, applying all these settings. So, from here, if you're ever attempting a simulation on your own and you kind of get lost, just follow the advisor for the time being, okay? Um, but for us, I'm just gonna click next. And here's the first thing that it asks you. What, what are you concerned about? What do you wanna analyze on this part, right? Um, do you wanna, are you worried about it taking a certain load? Are you worried about it buckling under a compressional load? Are you worried about it reacting under cycles of heat applied to it, right? Um, excessive shaking um, and all these different options. So if you were to go to the study advisor button here, click on the drop down menu and click new study. All these options open up on the left of the properties manager. So the name, um, that's a, just a name you could define this um, FBA study for. Um, so yeah, th that name could be anything. And then when you look at the type, you see that there's quite a bit, right? So I'm gonna be briefly talking about each one. Today we'll be playing around with mostly static. Um, but static is just applying a constant load, pressure, or torque to your part. So it's a just a constant load. Thermal is applying heat to your part, um, and then seeing how your part reacts to that. Frequency is applying a um, oscillating kind of uh, sinusoidal-like function, um, like force or pressure to it. Right. Buckling is seeing how your part will fail when it's under compressional load. Drop test is like an impact load um, when you're dropping your part or something. Um, this is super cool when you have like an entire car assembly design and then do a drop test on it and see how it gets banged up when you drop it from like 100 feet. So there's studies like that. Fatigue is seeing how your material will fail under cyclical loads. Um, so something like a keyboard switch, right? Um, on an average basis, it goes through uh, hundreds of clicks every day. Um, so seeing when it will fail after a certain amount of usage. Um, pressure vessel design is a pretty comprehensive um, combination of some of these uh, different studies where you're doing a thermal pressure and then frequency kind of loading all at once. Um, it's kind of as the name applies pressure vessel design. Um, it's like what happens when there's this vessel um, that has all these compressional um, like air inside of it or fluid inside of it, how does it react over time? So depending on what you want to study, um, you would choose one of these uh, study types if you're ever confused on which one to use, um, you would look and follow through with the study advisor. Um, for the time being, we're just gonna be applying a uh, constant load to this part, so we're gonna click on static. And then from there, click the green OK checkbox right above it. So cool, right after you do that, you notice that all these other options um, become solid, so you could apply them, right? So. The first thing after that that I'm gonna do is give it a material property. Um, if I wanna bend something, right, the software needs to know exactly what I am bending. I can't bend a generic, non-existent material. So, we're gonna click on Apply Materials, right there. And then, 
we're going to go to, we're just going to select this alloy steel option right there. Pretty generic. There's all these different options. So as you might have noticed from before, there are um, these, in these parameters, um, some of them became red and some of them became blue. Um, so so um, pretty much what these mean is that they are critical information um, for this test to be um, performed. If this information was blank, um, the software can't run this um, simulation test on it because it doesn't know how the material will react, which is defined numerically by these values. Um, so yeah, um, when you're running a study and you're trying to choose a material, make sure that these parameters are in there. If they're not, you can go online um, and then copy it off somewhere else and insert them in here. So, alloy seal selected. We're going to click on apply and then close this window. So now, our little part here has the material properties of alloy steel. So, the next part of this um, experiment, pretty much, in order for us to apply a load to this part, we need to fix it to something, right? It can't be free-floating in space. Um, if it was, and we tried to apply a load, it would just fly off forever and never come back. So we want to fix it to something, right? So it's kind of a cool thing what they did here. It made it super easy to follow along. It pretty much goes um, chronologically in order what steps you have to do. So the next part, fixturing, has a very similar setup to how study advisor was done. There's a fixture advisor, and there's different fixture options, right? We're going to click on fixture advisor for now to see what it opens up. And then it gives you these options right here. Kind of uh, describes to you what it's about, and then gives you the option. So adding a picture or creating a contact. So adding a picture is mainly to like just hold that part in there like solid, um, and then it won't move from that position. Um, for contacts, you usually use contacts a lot more in assemblies um, because assemblies are consistent of different parts. Um, they usually tend to move around each other, right? Um, and that's something you have to eventually define, how certain parts interact with each other. Um, and that's why doing FEA analysis on um, assemblies are a lot more complex than doing it on individual parts. Um, I'll be kind of talking about that more in a bit, about all the contacts. But we're going to do add a picture for now, right there. So. When you click add a picture, you can see this little example here, right? Just kind of like that little beam is just like waving back and forth. That's essentially what we'll be trying to do to this part here as well. So right here, underneath the standard fixed geometry uh, portion of the property set, um, the fixed ge there's a fixed geometry option, there's a roller slider option, and there's a fixed hinge option, right? Um, so yeah, so this, you would choose the appropriate one depending on how your part is fixed to, uh, fixed to something, right? If there were a bunch of little wheels here on this edge, and this little block moved around, we would do roller slider. If it was on a hinge, much like how a door hinge would be designed, where it moves um, up and down as soon as around, but it can't slide around, we would choose fixed hinge. Um, but we're just going to assume that this is bolted against the wall. So with fixed geometry selected, in the standard, um, we're going to click on this small face right here. And when you zoom in, you can see these little arrows forming out, right? So select that. You know that your feature has been selected by seeing it in the selection box right there. So pretty much what these arrows mean is that it's constricting it in these directions. So there's an arrow facing in the x direction that's constricting it, constricting it in the y and the z direction. So that portion of our part is absolutely fixed in space, so we can't move anymore. So yeah, that part's pretty simple. Um, once you have that selected, click OK. And then from here now, so we have our material property defined, we have our picturing done, now we have to define what kind of loads we'll be um, applying to this part. So. Very similar to fixturing, um, we're going to click on these, this little drop-down arrow to see what all the other options are. 
As you can see, there's force, torque, pressure, gravity, centrifugal force, bearing load, remote load mass, distributed mass, temperature, yada yada, so on, right? The most simple one is force. Obviously, you're just implying a single, uh, single force or something. Um, we're going to click on external loads advisor for now to see kind of what it has to say to us. Boop. And right there. It also gives you examples. If you hover over that example box right there, it kind of load a little animation in a bit. So yeah, so in this example right here, a street light signal post thing is um, um, an analysis is being run on it to see how it reacts when a bunch of wind is going through it, right? There's like payload weight, like what kind of stresses do you see when some, there's a bunch of uh, weight being applied to a part, and like user applied load, when someone's pushing down on a certain portion, where is the stress? So yeah, we're just gonna say add a load. It's the only option it really gives us. Add a load. So you see that your left side, all these options open up, right? So underneath the fourth slash torque portion, we're gonna just have force selected. If you wanted to kind of twist this bar around, you could do that as well by applying a torque. Um, we're just gonna apply a force and with the selection box highlighted, we're gonna click on this entire face right here. So by default, SolidWorks wants to apply whatever force you're applying evenly across this entire face here, um, right? You can kind of control that, um, and also the direction of the force. Currently, it's normal, perpendicular to the face that we selected, right? It's going straight down against it. Um, we could select multiple sides if we wanted to, to apply a load onto. I feel like this would absolutely break everything, so we're not going to do that, but just as an example, right? So I'm going to clear selections and just reselect this top face. So yeah, um, let's say hypothetically your force wasn't normal to the surface right here. Then you could click on the select direction, select the direction button right here. And it lets you choose in what reference, um, in what reference direction that force is going towards, right? Um, so for example, let's see. If we were to try that, what would that be? Uh, so yeah, I select this edge right here, and then all the force vectors are now going in parallel with that edge. Um, obviously that wouldn't really do much if you're trying to apply like a sliding force on the very top of a surface, it wouldn't really do much to it. Um, but you, ha you do have that option. If you were to insert a diagonal line sketch here, and then you selected that sketch, you could, sele um, you could start applying diagonal lo uh, loads to it. Uh, for the time being, we're going to go back to, uh, let's see, we're going to go back to normal force. And then we'll play around with this for a bit. So right there, um, you're allowed to select the units you want. Um, so if you do it in SI, it's like Pascals, right? Um, you could do it in English, which would be like PSI or um, like just um, pounds, right? Um, if you do it in metrics, um, metric and SI are pretty much the same thing. The rest of the world decides to use metrics, so the international system is metric. Down here, you can define what the value of your force is. So we're going to go a little crazy and go 9,000. Is that 90,000? That's 90,000. 9,000 newtons. So right underneath it, you can also see there's a button for reversing direction of your applied force. You can change that to however you want. We're going to have it pointing down for now. And then from there, the next tab right here, we're not going to really mess around with this, but it's an available option. So I mentioned before that the force that you're applying is uniformly distributed along the surface right here, right? Um, but if you have non-uniform distribution checked on, 
depending on your how you define your coordinate system and you could define how the force is spread across the surface here. Um, the only reason we hardly mess around with it is because you have to define it in a mathematical equation, which is that edit equation button right there. Um, so if you know how to do um, like differential force distribution, um, shouldn't be too bad if you put a little thought into it, um, but I don't want to really do that part right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, you'd be able to define that um, custom setting if you'd want to. So we're going to check that off for the time being. Uh, we want our force distributed equally among this portion. And then once you have that done, click on the OK checkbox. And we have this. So we have our fixturing, our materials, and our force, our external force. And now we are we're going to have to do something called meshing. So pretty much the reason why this is called FEA when you're doing this analysis, it stands for finite element analysis, right? So if you were given this block of material here, you could theoretically break it down into infinitely small parts, right? Um, it could be like an atom's worth of steel material. Um, however, a computer cannot compute something that's infinitely, um, infinite in qu uh, like quantity. Um, it has to have a certain extent or it'll be running literally forever. Um, and that's where the word finite comes into. So, kind of show it to you in a, right now, so, if you go to run this study, don't click on that button, but the little arrow under it, we're going to click on create mesh. So when you click on create mesh, this little option on the side opens up. Um, the first mesh density has the option of coarse or fine. You can kind of slide around. Um, the coarser your mesh is, um, the lower resolution your results will be. The finer your mesh is, the higher resolution they will be. So we'll kind of, we're going to be kind of playing around this portion here. So mesh, keep, let's do it at really coarse for now. Click OK. And this is the result that it gives us. So it meshes this part that we have. It's a pretty simple part, so the computer does it really easily. But we see these little triangles starting to form on it, right? So in this analysis, this is the individual finite element that we have now, right? So it considers this little chunk of material here as a singular block that moves as a single piece. Um, this allows a computer to assume certain parameters, but you can also see why if you have a coarse resolution on, your results wouldn't be as accurate, right? Um, because you would have larger bulk motion parts. If I was to go back into mesh on the side here, Right click it, and then let's see, let's do create mesh again. We're gonna bump it up to fine, all the way to the right. And then click on okay. It takes a little bit longer to render it, but now you notice that your individual elements are a lot smaller. And if we zoom out, it's kind of hard to identify each element, right? Because the computer is applying the load to each element, um, a smaller portion of your element. So if you were to define it mathematically, it would be your dB, your differential volume size. Um, you would end up getting a much more accurate result. But also at the same time, it takes longer for the computer to compute this mesh and also to run the results on this as well. Uh, so with that in mind, let's go back to mesh. Let's edit our mesh to be somewhere around in the middle. A good trade-off, right? Not too intensive and accurate enough. So um, before you click on OK, um, there are a few things I just want to show you guys. Um, if you clicked on Mesh Parameters, you'll be able to custom um, numerically define the size of each of your mesh um, elements right there, right? Um, you can change um, what kind of shape polygon they have. Currently, they're triangles. Um, there are FEA simulations run where these elements are represented as squares, octagons, hexagons. Um, really depends on the analysis you're trying to do. Um, and then you can define the custom parameters of the size, as you can see there. And yeah, there's an advanced option which I'm going to kind of go over. Um, so yeah, turn mesh parameters off. I'm just going to do what the computer defines by default. Put it at a medium setting, click on OK. 
give it time to mesh, and it'll return this to you. So once we have all these set, so we have our fixturing, our load, and then we have our material property set and our elements defined. Now we could run this study. So up here, just click on run this study. Boop. And now it's gonna start computing. Boop. And this colorful, very colorful image is what you end up with. So cool. So by default, I just click on a different button to kind of get all these colors, right? It's really colorful. Um, but when you look to your left on your toolbar here, um, at the bottom of results, you see there's four different lines. So one says stress, one says displacement, one says strain, and the other one also says displacement one. So by default, displacement one, this is selected, the bottom option. This kind of just shows you what it's going to look like under that load case. Um, but it doesn't show you any other information. Just, okay, this is what the final view would look like. Um, and also, this might not be correct. I'll be kind of going over why this might be just an exaggerated view and not a realistic one. So we're going to go ahead and click on stress one under the results, right there. So when you click on stress one, there's a lot of colors on our part now, right? It's a pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Looks pretty awesome, actually. So these colors are representative of something, right? They're not just there for fun. Um, so if you look to your right here, there's a little scale. So it's in a scale of von Mises, uh, von Mises, which is a unit of newtons per meter squared, right? So newtons per meter squared, it's a force over an area. It's a pressure or a stress um, value. So if you guys don't know about this quite yet, um, stress is pretty much the same thing as how much pressure is being applied to something. Um, and you can see those values there. So let's zoom out so it's a little clearer. The, cor um, the colors on your part correspond to the uh, amount of stress that specific part is um, feeling right now. So the reason why it's the most highest stress concentration around the edge right here is because the front part of our um, part, yeah, the front end of our part um, is allowed to deflect freely, right? Um, so it just kind of takes that weight and then starts moving down. However, the closer we get to our fixture, it's, that part is bound to a wall or an immovable fixturing right there. Um, so because it can't move and there's a force being applied to it, it's starting to bend on that portion. Um, so there's a lot of stress that's building up in that portion right there. And you can see the distribution as you kind of go along there, right? So if you were to apply an extremely large load to the point where it would break, um, this arrow right here shows you that the yield strength of our material. So yield strength is an inherent material property. Um, this alloy steel um, yields or breaks, or not really breaks, but kind of um, starts to deform at about 6.204 times 10 to the eighth newtons per meter squared, right? And if we look at the scale here, we're well below that, even on our maximum value. So we don't have to actually worry about our part deforming. But you kind of look at it and go like, wait, but how come the results look like it deformed, right? So we'll be kind of going over that next. So on the results portion, let's click on the second line, displacement. So as soon as you click that, you notice that the color is shifted to the other side, right? Instead of this portion being red, the end is. Um, so in this case, um, it's a scale of how much the part moved by um, from its original position. It's in the scale of millimeters. So right now, our end here only moved by 2.5 millimeters. Um, but it looks like a lot more. Um, this is a 15 inch bar. So that should be somewhere around like two, three inches, not just two millimeters, right? Um, but we could tell that by this scale, the end moves the most because it's not fixtured to anything. Whereas this portion right here, since it's fixed, it won't be really going anywhere. So to get a realistic view of what happened, we're gonna right click on the displacement line. 
And then we're going to go up all the way to edit definition. I'm going to give that a click. So this parameter opens up in the properties manager. So deformed shape is turned on, right? So usually you want that turned on to see what it's going to look like after it deforms. Um, by default, it has that automatic setting set up. And it's set to a scale of 15.152 and so on. So I don't know how it chooses the default values, but currently our deflection is exaggerated by a scale of 15.1. So what if we want a true view, right? We just click on true scale right there, that radio button. From there, click OK. And this is what our part actually looks like, or actually should look like, once it was informed. I'm going to go into a side view. And you notice that there's a little bit of a wiggle there, but realistically it's not much moving, right? So the purpose of that, um, that deformation exaggeration is to let us see, okay, how is this part going to react if we apply more and more force to it over time, right? If you wanted a really unrealistic deformation scale, we can go back into edit definition. This time, instead of true scale or automatic, we can click on user define. And then we're going to go for somewhere like 100 times. <laughs> and then that's kind of what you end up with. The live noodle kind of look to it. face it's hot headed this is all right over there looks very angry so yeah so that's kind of the um, what you could do with displacement um, so displacement only shows you the change from its original position um, however the next part the next line in these um, left here under results is strain so while well, displacement shows um, change from original position, displace, uh, strain shows how much the material in itself has um, deflected by, so uh, how much it has stretched out or compressed by, um, rather than just moving around. So for displacement, we noticed that this top portion was red. It was the portion that moved the most. However, for here, the bottom is the part. Um, the fixturing area is the part portion that strains the most. Because if you think about it, if you were to hold a handle like this and bend it down, um, the head of the handle wouldn't really stretch out anywhere, right? But because that picturing point, or I guess in this point we could call it our fulcrum, is bound to that area, if you were to bend it, it would stretch out a lot. So it kind of shows you, okay, this portion is going to be the area that strains the most. And then strain is kind of unitless, as you can see. Um, it's just defined as strain. Um, and it, strained by a value of 6.325 times 10 to the negative 4. So if you were designing a part such as this, right, and you knew that this load was going to be on there, after you run this analysis, you could say, OK, so the most stress is accumulated at this point right here. Um, I probably need to beef this portion up a bit, right? Especially if you saw this yielding sign right there. So. Let's get, go in and try that, actually. Let's go back to our external load under this left side. We're going to right click that, edit definition, go to our force value, and let's change that to 90,000. Let's see, we might break the computer. We're, we're going to click on OK, and we're going to go back to, um, actually, we can do it right here. So down here on the left, results. Can we rerun it? Actually, I guess not. So we're going to go back up to the top toolbar here, and then we're going to run this study again. So this time, it's going to load the new values. OK, so excessive displacements were calculated in this model. If your system is properly restrained, consider using the large displacement option. Um, we're going to say, OK, see what you do. So the computer already throws a warning at you. It's like, yeah, your load is extremely, extremely large. We have no idea what's going to happen quite yet. And let's go 
go. And that's kind of what happens to a part. From this to this. But we did do a hundred times exaggeration, I believe. So let's go back into our scale for under the displacement results and then change it to true scale. See what that looks like. So, under real life conditions now, your part would have bent this much. So it actually moved significantly, right? So it probably ended up yielding. And if we go back to our stress results, our yield strength is still the same because it's a material property. And now you see that arrow on our scale right there. So anything on our part past the portion, uh, past the color of this portion right here, past that line, has officially yielded now, according to the uh, simulation. It has officially kind of given up and said, okay, I'm gonna start bending now. Um, so yeah, it's almost to the point where probably this portion here probably ended up snapping off if you applied that much load to this part right here. Um, so yeah, if you notice any part on a design that exceeds this yield value, you usually want to strengthen that portion. You're like, okay, it's gonna probably give out on me. Um, and this helps you analyze your parts and make certain decisions on, okay, how do I improve my designs? Maybe I wanna try a different material. Um, maybe you can't handle this load. Um, maybe I'll shorten this length um, so there's less load applied at that point. Um, and it kind of guides you through intelligent decisions you know, going through your design. So you're not just kind of guessing it and winging certain design aspects, right? Um, from here, if you were to um, get these results and you notice that it kind of gave out at this point, right? Um, you would know that your part wouldn't work um, under these conditions and you would have to go back to the drawing board, right? Um, yeah, so that's um, pretty much the um, essence of simulation. You guys can start kind of playing around with it and applying different loads to it to see what it does. So, we could... There we go. So if you were to click on the compare results button up here, and then just click OK with, uh, by ignoring all the other parameters, um, by default, it displays all four different settings for you. Um, stress, strain, displacement, and displacement without any color indications on it. Um, so something like this is another great tool when you're doing presentations or design reviews, right? Um, you're trying to make this, and you have to some, in some way validate the design choices that you made. Um, this would be a tool in order for you to do that. Uh -huh. So, exit compare. Yeah, um, that's pretty much the end of simulations. Um, when you guys get the chance, if you guys ever want to play around with some of the other um, simulation functions, um, feel free to talk to us. We can kind of guide you through those portions. Um, but also at the same time, the study advisor for the um, simulations um, functions really guide you through it as well. So it's nice to read those at times. Um, Follow along with that if you're ever confused. Um, regarding that, any questions?